Hi Queensland Poetry Festival, my name is Sharmila Beesmohan and I'm part of the literature organisation Speaking Volumes, which is based in London in the UK. This year we're celebrating our 10th anniversary and it was our great pleasure to put together an anthology called Not Quite Right For Us, which has 40 authors writing poetry, fiction and non-fiction um, under the theme Not Quite Right For Us. Sarah Sanders, Nick Chapman and I, who form Speaking Volumes, are so pleased to be part of this event. I'm going to be talking to three of the poets who you'll hear reading later. Francesca Beard is a London-based poet and spoken word artist who's performed a number of one-woman shows across the UK and beyond. Richard Georges is the British Virgin Islands' first poet laureate and an award-winning poet who also um, teaches. And Andy Jackson is a well-known Australian poet who writes around themes of disability. Please enjoy listening to them and um, hearing a little bit more about their life and work. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'd like to introduce you to three great poets who are part of this reading later. We have in the British Virgin Islands, Richard Georges, in London, Francesca Beard, and in Melbourne, I think, is it? Or just outside Melbourne, Andy Just Jackson. outside. Thank you, Hi. Andy. So um, I'm going to just kick off by asking these three great poets a few questions, and hopefully we'll find out a little bit more about their, their lives and their poetry. So I'd like to start maybe by asking Francesca first to tell us a little bit more about your writing in general and what you do and produce. So I, I'm really interested in working with audiences live, uh, historically live audiences, but actually during lockdown, it's been online audiences. So I'm, I'm, I really love um, asking people questions. Uh, I feel like I've, the questions are really exciting for me. Uh, I feel like I operate in a, an atmosphere of uncertainty and um, I like to explore that. So my work's about uncertainty and questions and asking other people if they are weird like me. Richard, tell us a little bit about your work. Well, I, I think my, my preoccupation in my career so far has been about um, locating uh, the British Virgin Islands within the archipelago and within the, the Caribbean canon and tradition. Uh, first and foremost, and then sort of moving outwards from there. Um, uh, you know, th there are a number of larger or louder registers uh, um, with respect to Caribbean history and Caribbean writing that often overlook the smaller spaces. I know the Caribbean is already a small space, but BVI is even a smaller space within that. Um, and, you know, oftentimes the smaller islands, the lesser Antilles are, are a little overlooked. Uh, with respect to their contributions to literature and uh, with respect to their contributions to the political, the geographical, the topographical uh, spaces, uh, landscapes, seascapes. So I'm all about sort of like elevating like these quieter histories and, and these uh, lesser known spaces into that larger conversation and trying to find connections uh, as well as the, those points of, of particularity. Andy, Australian audiences may know you already, but for those of us who aren't in Australia, please tell us a bit about your work. Yeah, I've been writing poetry for, you know, 15, 20 years. And I think when I first started, it really came out of um, wanting to express what it means, what it feels like, what it is, the complexity of being in a different body, a uh, visibly different body, disabled body. Um, and as you think, you know, when you first were starting out, you think, I'll get that out of my system and then I'll move on. But of course, you can't move on from being different, uh, being not quite right. So, you know, it, it's evolved. My writing's evolved and I've explored different aspects of that and biographical poetry as well as autobiographical. So, yeah, trying to explore, I guess, empathy and solidarity and what it means. I, I guess, of course, like others have said, it's different now uh, because we're we're very conscious of our connections, um, but also we're super aware of the things that have been amplified, uh, the differences that have been amplified through the pandemic. So, yeah, that's where I'm at. 
Just following on from that, um, Andy, how can you tell us a bit more about how the pandemic has changed maybe what you're writing about in the last year and a half? I mean, I guess in Australia, you're just going back into a bit of a lockdown now. So um, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, look, it's been interesting for a number of reasons over this period. I've been really not writing much at all and reminding myself that actually there are seasons for these things. And for me, not writing has been a case of just sitting with the uncertainty um, and not knowing what's ahead. You know, uh, we've been in and out of lockdown. We've been watching numbers, uh, you know, coming out, going back in and also just very much aware that, uh, yeah, it's okay. It's a processing time. Uh, what I did notice was particularly um, something about the mask, you know, for me, and not being out in public so much. Uh, there's less visibility. There's less sense of, you know, coming out in public and being subjected to being looked at. But for everyone wearing a mask was this kind of visible symbol of uh, we are connected to each other. So that was an interesting thing and just it's interesting to observe these sort of discussions going on and just these little visible signs that we all have so yeah that's been really curious. Um, Richard how is the situation for you in the BVI have you been impacted at all by having lockdowns and that kind of thing and has that resonated within your work? Yes I think um you know, so in my, in my day job, I, I run the, the only uh, college here. So quite a bit of responsibility there. And so you can imagine in the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, the responsibilities are sort of amplified uh, with respect to the, the, the welfare of about, about 800 students and about 120 or so staff. Um, and actually, as we speak, the BVI is experiencing its first real surge of, of cases. So, you know, we were very blessed over the past, you know, 12 to 15 months or so um, with, with reasonably low number of cases. Um, and that has all like skyrocketed, skyrocketed in the past, the past week, really. So, you know, it's been very dramatic uh, um, in terms of trying to um, manage home life, work life, et cetera, and then trying to find time where I can uh, for my writing life. Um, so that, that's been the, the, the biggest change. I had a period early in the year where I was able to take two weeks off and I got some, you know, lots and lots of writing done. And that's kind of been it. <laughs> I haven't been able to write much at all. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful by the end of this month and into next month, I'll be able to do some writing. I think a lot of people feel that the pandemic has maybe led to less kind of time for things like serious reading, let alone serious writing. So I can completely understand how writing might be difficult at this time. How have you found it, Francesca? Um, well, I've, I found it, um, it, I have found, uh, I, I'm kind of hesitating here because I'm aware that there's been huge amounts of um, suffering and in fact I've been very close to people who uh, a friend of mine died my elderly father has gone into a kind of terrible uh, depression however I personally and creatively have found it um, amazing I, I often wrestle with you know what's the point of this and why am I doing this and imposter syndrome and permissions and I feel that a lot of the work that um, I was doing once it had all got swept away the work that came back very quickly was work that um, I was doing with communities with and in communities uh, who were at risk or of isolation um, quite a lot of the time and we we kept going and we we managed to try and um, and meet um, uh, online and a lot of the people that I work with are weren't really on wi-fi before so there's this incredibly um, scrambling, not at all competent learning curve of trying to get everyone connected. And that has been so um, 
a, a positive for me to be part of that process of like set thinking why are we doing this why are we being creative why are we artists what is our role in society and I feel like um I, I've come out of it with a, a greater awareness of, of what I'm doing and a kind of a kind of an ability to forget about ambition or, or being good or being praised in terms of connection so I that for me has been really positive I also think it's been this incredible, um, slightly um, unilateral enforced sabbatical, you know? <laughs> so, you know, we've all kind of, uh, obviously, um, if, you, if you're desperately worried about money or where your meal's coming from or your safety, that's not the case. But in general, it's been really lovely to just to think, oh, the bar is really low. And, and actually, in a way, rather than rushing in um, to fill a void and immediately start creating a story, Maybe we should just, as as you guys have said, just take a bit of stock, just listen and observe, and and be in an uncertainty again. So that's felt like a uh, an opportunity, a gift, actually. So of course, one way that you all have connected, albeit um, through print, has been through the anthology. Not quite right for us, and. Um, I sent you all a brief, which was probably quite wide in terms of um, writing something which um, connected to that phrase, not quite right for us. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about when you got that brief, what did you want to convey in the poem that you wrote that everyone watching will read when they go and buy the book? And maybe we could start with Richard this time. For me, it really gave me an opportunity to start thinking about a new aesthetic, uh, you know, a, a new uh, approach, a fresh approach. I was very grateful for that because um, I was looking for, for for something something different for myself, um, something fresh. You know, it was very. I, I was very aware that my last collection. Um, while, while it was quite successful, the most successful project I've had as a writer, it sort of had a period to start, I don't want to say pigeonholing me into like a, you know, disaster poet, you know. Um, I started getting all of these calls from these organizations that I was sure wasn't, weren't, didn't really quite know who I was, but knew, oh, he, he had a book about a hurricane, so therefore it must be a fit. You know, and then so I, some of those I declined, I kept the ones I felt fit um, with, with what I was trying to accomplish. So it kind of gave me a, a really fresh start to kind of like start looking at a, a poetic approach that was still me and not, you know, pop, you know, trying to play into this, um, this, this, this narrative that I feared might start being uh, created for me. So I, I thought it was, it was a really good opportunity for me to say, well, you know, you know, um, I, I'm a, a writer or a poet first with, with, with a, 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 a kaleidoscope of, of interests, and desires and, and, um, and, and, and flaws that I really wanted to, you know, embrace. Um, so I, I think if anything, the one thing that has been consistent for me as can be seen in the poem that I submitted was um, a sort of uh, not pastoral so much um, maybe more of a naturalistic approach to things and um, you know the landscape and the flora and the fauna and the, and, and the life that is out there you know is always central um, as opposed to necessarily the, the history the politics or, 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 um, or climate um, so I, I felt, you know, there's opportunity to kind of like embrace that and again to, to try not trying to um, find what centers me in my poetry, which is a, a sense of wonder and a sense of, 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 uh, of ecstasy and appreciation of the world around me. Francesca, you don't often have poems published. So um, how did you approach this brief? Oh, it was such a joy. I don't often have poems published. I, I guess um, when I first started, I thought of myself as a poet and I sent my work off and it got rejected. And very quickly I thought, I'm not going to survive this. I, you know, I'm sending my poems. I, um, I know and they're not right for any of these journals. They don't want them. 
and then I found my way through um, open mics because no one can stop you at an open mic, you know? <laughs> although it was terrifying. And I really felt completely like I was leaping off, off a cliff to do the open mics. It very quickly felt not egotistical, but actually incredibly connecting. I found that their spoken word environment was so welcoming, so supportive. In, in London where I started out um, and, and in fact internationally I think it's an incredibly nurturing kind um, environment people are really um, generous to each other that's my experience um, so I just I've really gone down the spoken word route um, and uh, and also the money route because you can get paid to um, to make shows so I do a lot of um, theatrical uh, spoken word um, and I think that's how I um, uh, met you and speaking volumes as well through my live uh, performance work so this was um, I was really scared but actually when I started um, to, to work on the poem um, it was a gift honestly I loved it so much and I, I kind of found myself completely immersed and really you know just putting my whole heart into it it felt like like that little poem felt like a whole movie in my head I was with atmospheres and it was such a gift and it was one of the things that has really um, filtered and held part of the pandemic for me that experience of writing for not quite right for us I also want to say that I love the the collection I love everyone's work in it I think it's absolutely beautiful so it's been it's been so positive that experience and of being in, in you know published in a book as well like part of me is like oh I'm in a book with all these amazing people yeah so it's, it's been just wonderful I hope you do buy the book everyone it's really great oh thanks Francesca um Andy so <clears throat> we met only a year ago wasn't it um mm. when I was in Australia and I was introduced to Andy via another author who's in the book Gail Sabot um so <clears throat> I don't know how much exposure you've had to being part of the the poetry scene in the UK. Um, so how did it feel being approached to be part of this? Oh, look, I was uh, hugely excited by um, speaking volumes, but particularly by this exact prompt, you know. Um, it just seemed to me to be so open and so kind of resonating with what I already do. And it just felt like, all right, great. Let's dive into this. Um, curiously, at the time, I just finished writing a whole collection of poems and I was a little bit dry. And so I came to a point of going, oh, I don't know how am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? You know, what am I, where what am I gonna write? I wanted to write something quite um really about the how good it can be to not fit in. Um in the end, I didn't write that poem. <laughs> uh, it sort of wrote itself. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about um, really, like I, I turned 50 this year and I'd also been involved in an anthology that was about, uh, it was called Growing Up Disabled in Australia. And so I've been thinking about what, what I'd experienced as a teenager and what I experienced recently and this sense that um, I'm still going through it. So the poem that I wrote, um, takes on the persona of Sisyphus and it just reckons with this thing of getting up each day and doing the same thing over and over again. Um, you know, I think for not just disabled people, but anyone who's not quite right for us, you know, um, has this sense of the burden of it. Um, and, you know, there are cliches on both ends. It's either tragic or inspiring, but it's neither. It's actually all the spectrum in between of just doing it over and over and building your muscle, <laughs> you know, lifting the weight. Um, so, you know, maybe it is a little bit positive on some level, but um, yeah, it's all of that stuff. So I, I was so grateful to get this call out. And again, like Francesca, I just felt really, the poem kind of happened and yeah, it's rare that that happens. So I'm, I'm really grateful to you. Well, we're really grateful that all of you said yes to being in the edition because it's, um, for speaking volumes, it's been a dream to be able to celebrate 10 years with a multitude of voices from three different continents. And um, 
to just work with people who we've worked with before, but also people who we wanted to work with and would love to carry on working with in the future. So hopefully this is the start of our next 10 years of interconnectedness. Just very quickly, I wanted to ask if there was anything that um, in the book that um, really struck you or that you had um, that resonated, that was a favourite piece maybe. Um, maybe um, Andy, you could start if there was anything. Yeah, look, I want to say two things. One of them is that just, I just find the whole thing incredibly, diverse is an overused word, but like really surprising. You really don't know what you're going to get from one thing to the next. Um, if I was to pick one piece, uh, there's multiple reasons for this, but I, I want to um, encourage everyone to read Gail Sobot's piece. Um, it's just super strange and super real and beautiful and mythological. And uh, yeah, she's a poet to watch, I think. But the whole thing, I just find a beautiful collection. I'm sort of savoring it. You, Richard, was there any one piece that really stayed with you? I'm not sure if I can say the title on the Zoom, but the poem by, by Jay Bernard, um, the lessons poem. I, 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 I quite enjoyed it. I thought it was, um, I always enjoyed their work, um, but I thought this one in particular was stirring. So I think that'll be my choice. And what about you, Francesca? Uh, it's really hard, honestly. One of the things that I really love about the book is the the mix of genres. The, uh, so again, you know, is you, you you kind of I wasn't reading it linearly. I was kind of flipping back and forth and kind of looking at the chapters. And I love. I think that for me, I think. Um, uh, well, obviously, you know, um, Andy Jackson. I would totally say you should, you should look at, and also if there was another one, maybe Richard George's. But um, but no, in truth, I I do I I think that it's it's the 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 mix. It's the mix that makes it really really special. Um, you know, maybe a kind of a little shout out to um, Fergal Hart's piece, which really amused me. And that kind of wasn't, what kind of genre was that? I think that's a new genre completely. But no, it's, a, it's like, um, it's like a, a treasure cave. You wander in and I mean, it's such a cliche, my goodness. But um, I think it's, it's just the, the, the kind of the, 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 the spaces in between these incredible, definite, specific voices that um, creates such a kind of a dynamic um, environment. It's beautiful. The whole, you know, the collection is beautiful, I would say. Well, thanks. I really um, think we could actually just chat properly, hopefully in a space together for a much longer time than we have today. So just like to finish by asking you, if there's one thing you want to say to the Queensland Poetry Festival audiences, what would you like to say? Um, let's start with you, Francesca. Uh, I'm sending love. Thanks so much for wanting to to get to know us. And um, I, I hope one day I can ask you some questions and get to know you. Um, yeah, just thank you. Thanks for thanks for welcoming us. It, it, um, it's incredibly appreciated. How about you, Richard? Well, it's a pleasure to you know um, always a pleasure to share space with Shamila. and it's also a pleasure to meet Francesca and Andy virtually. I'm very happy to um, share in the fellowship, the digital fellowship of the festival. And I've um, never been to Queensland, hope to be at some point in person. Uh, so it, it's great that, you know, you know, with all of the, the tragedy and pain that the pandemic has brought, that it, it has also brought opportunities for connection that, you know, we haven't really considered in the past. So this is a beautiful way for us to deal with what are trying times so very much appreciate uh, everyone's um, space their time their appreciation and their love thank you and a familiar space for you the queensland poetry festival so what would you just like to say to round off yeah look um one of my favorite literary festivals that i've ever been to i love queensland poetry um beautiful people behind it and I, I sort of miss it you know uh, Brisbane feels as far away as London at the moment you know um, so yeah 
it's a place that's in my heart and I'm kind of, I can visualize the audience now. I can feel the memory of what it's like to be there. It's a beautiful space and it's a privilege to be a part of it. I just, um, yeah, take care of each other up there. Uh, look after each other, look after yourselves. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. So much. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you today and hopefully we'll get the chance to do so on more than one occasion in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much to Francesca Beard, Richard Georges and Andy Jackson for that great conversation. We're now delighted to present a film of nine of the poets from the anthology reading their work. Starting off is Jay Bernard, the London-based poet who previously appeared at the Queensland Poetry Festival. Then you'll hear the veteran poet and singer John Hegley. Joshua Idahin is based in Stockholm and is also part of the band Benin City. You'll then hear Jamie Thresavulu, who is Derby County Football Club's poet in residence. Amina Atik describes herself as a Yemeni Scouse poet, and she was previously part of Queensland Poetry Festival's online programme. Richard Georges, the British Virgin Islands first poet laureate, will read his piece. Francesca Beard, the London-based poet and spoken word performer, will be following Richard, and you'll then hear from Australia's very own Laniak, First Nations poet, Finally, Andy Jackson will read his stellar piece from the book. We really hope you enjoy all of these poets and also find out more about Speaking Volumes at www.speaking-volumes.org.uk. Thank you so much. History. What causes me to type your name? It's late, and I am three beers in when you appear. A genie at the search terms. You plus London, your last name plus dead. You plus our old school. Now I know of time as tin opener. Cuts in circles, leaves a hinge. The grey waters that we pour away. Had someone thought to teach a class on love? I might know you. Geography. We sometimes walk the back way home past my house so I could shake you off. Right now I want to make this the story of two working class kids but there are degrees to work and class. And I am pissed off with or ashamed by the two up two down fantasy when the truth is that after Pokemon I'd kick you out because if my mother met you, like the time when we got to your door and your mother dragged you in by the neck. Where in the curriculum does it say what a child should do next? Drama. No longer hungry, I stand up in the dining hall and offer my meal to the poorest student in my class. Music. Between Googles, I watch compilation videos of top 10 worst auditions for X Factor. I don't find it funny, just compelling, like folk art. Almost all of them are mentally ill in one way or another, and all of, almost all of them confess this right away in their teeth, their shitty style, their choice of song, and most of them are poor. The interesting bit is when they're done and Simon asks, what was that? And they say they might not be the best singer now, but they've got potential. I don't think many of them are looking for fame really, but want to be taken on, fed, trained, blow dried like a Pomeranian, but they've bit their nails to porridge, their feet sweat through their shoes. And Simon says, you can't sing, just as I once told a girl in my class that she would amount to nothing. And in the heat that ensues, their argument is less whether they can reach the crescendo of I will always love you, but if someone treated them nicely, they could. PSHE. I was sent an email once by someone explaining that they would not help me because I was flaky, inconsistent, rude, non-collegiate, unworthy of anything I had. He too was from Carandon, my old ancestral land, and for a second I feared the Old Testament God, who still reigns there, had reversed my salvation. 
I was extremely surprised, amazed, and even dumbfounded, to be very honest, against my own will. I found myself wondering how you could be working there, and more astonishingly, keeping the position. But so far, you seem to be doing well there, so my warmest congratulations. The world tells you everything that will happen. I knew then what I know now. The heart has a tendency to plump in advance of a laceration. Dance. Walking home through Spitalfields, a man shakes his bucket for mental health. I have no cash, so I refuse. He doesn't care about the change. He seems to know what I have done. You people are unbearable, you know that? You people around here are unbearable. My brother's suit's too big for me. It smells of cigarette smoke so. But I decide to step inside and risk my first school disco. You'll be there and I will dare to share with you my disco fever. On my arrival, Thompson's in a t-shirt and looking round I clearly see oversized formality. It's not the way to be tonight. There's not another brother's suit in sight. I can't recall exactly just how awkward is my asking you to dance. I remember how reluctantly you joined me on the dance floor. It's more of a scuffle than a dance. So I go and blow my disco charm. Then there is the raffle, the announcement of the winner of the two Bob Lucky voucher to spend at the tuck shop counter. I call out, hey, that winning number's mine. There isn't any cheering when I do. I fear I will hear Thompson going boo. I wanted to assign you a swig of my pop and the option of a Winning crunchy bar. At least I have the sense to see eyes that are not there for me, that do not drink complicity. My brother's suit's too big for me, and upstairs on the bus on my way home, I eat up all those sweeties, feeling bitter to the bone. I consume those crunchies on my own. Off the bus when I get back Before the suit is on the rack My little sister wants to know How did it go Down the disco I slacken in an armchair I give it a few moments And I say You see this raffle ticket She sees the raffle ticket And I say you're looking at a winner, by the way. I see brethren in a foreign land. We cross paths and exchange a nod. In this kind of place, where this kind of pigment is scarce, I don't really care if brethren is from these parts. It's enough they exist. Because just this last hour past, some Berliner asked me if I saw ganja in two languages. No one but brethren knows how mad that is. A nod is not a thing taught me, like a handshake or a courtesy. My first one was on an escalator in Helsinki. I was heading up. Brethren was descending. We clocked each other, and I hadn't realised how alone I had been. All this time, 
in a mall of cotton looks. Upon brethren's eyes, I felt seen. As brethren passed by, I would have said hi, but my pride wouldn't let me. Go for a hog, maybe a high five. Most scared brethren wouldn't get me. But they did a nod. And without thinking, I did a nod. And that's how I knew we were safe. Like, all it takes is us brethren and Helsinki is my city. Us brethren and Berlin is my backyard. Us brethren and Sweden is my garden. Any other time, we would have shaken hands. Taken seats at a random, politely hostile cafe. Chuckled at the awkward interaction with the counter girl. Our masks off, our smiles big and bad. Our language uncoded, our laughter untethered. To decorum, bullying the premises. Our voices so loud and unbothered, like we are in the bellies of our mother's kitchens, like we are about to fight, like we live here. Sometimes there's a nod, sometimes there's not. Sometimes they didn't see you, sometimes they don't see you, sometimes they are lost, sometimes you are lost. Sometimes you're straight jacketed in your skin and theirs is an unfortunate disguise, so it's a blessing when we do clock and the joy is unlocked. I don't want to gas up emotions. I don't want to let them know our motions. So we keep interactions brief. Solidarity as a raised bow. Love is a hand on chest, respect a two-fingered salute. Shot from the brow, blessings sent with a wink. Inside our smiles, our whole sonnets, the ears of them lot are ignorant too. We are comets passing through a clouded night. We are needles in a haystack state, where the God of the land don't know our face, and the law of the land's like know your place. But look at that, we found each other, so we must be safe. How amazing is this? Are we not alive? Is that not a good thing? and watch them load their memories of this promised land into the back of a transit van. It was too much, so escape reality through backstreet boozer saloon door. Entered the promised land in nanoseconds. Arrived and present. Liverpool thrashing city on the telly. Jed, the true Brit, is hosting an angry post-work barstool summit. Judgment slammed down, calling glass clang on wood. Got some cheat them lot. Summit not quite right about that. Could be carrying bodies or drugs or out. Look at the state of them. Not quite right. The glare from a headlight skims the Romanian number plate and watched through the window. Watched the family load now to write home about into a self-addressed envelope. And now there's a few of Jed's cronies at it, dishing out the banter, serving it up with all the sauce and trimmings. And then there's a goal. And the summit loses momentum. The convo turns to Derby-born men arguing over falsified allegiances. There's not a man called Scarter in the building. So pipe it down, you pair. Jed's not losing this one. Oh, no, he's not losing this one. Eyes bulge towards the window once more. Just who do they think they are? Just who do they think they are? It's really not right and watched Jed's blood boil to a chemical crescendo, mouth frothed, teeth chopping like a guillotine, and off to the bogs for a leveller, reappears with a ring of confidence, next that calling gas, and he's outside, Jed is outside the building for a fag, and the streetlights pan to a young Romanian lad, asking Jed for a lighter, light please sir, light please sir, Jed obliges, sure he does, lands him a good un, ha ha ha, and watches Gob flobbed right across the youth's bra. And then Jed is down, Jed is down and out of the building. 
and waking up with a crowd around him. And there is more laughter than tears. And I'm just watching. I'm just watching him come round whilst passing the young Romanian lad a lighter and telling him he can keep it. We kissed at the border, but you stole my heart, offering it to Nejran. But I was too young to understand this warfare love story when my tongue is tied to the English home. But we lose ourselves in our peculiar summer pilgrimages to a place elsewhere. But only the diaspora, cross-legged children understand, slurring basic Arabic letters across the cabinet classroom. Your teacher, tall as you, pointing her nose upwards. Never lose yourself in this place, even if you lose yourself. But these children, they dream of abstract checkpoints of stick men in uniform confessing to the moon with their flags stuck upright. We search for our home in our radical love letters across the English channel pushing the French waters when the lifeguard sleeps. We recreate the kiss of the border, rotted in abandonment, stuttering its national anthem, it turns in its grave, and the invaders prowling in your summer journeys is a love story missing. So the school bell rings, the children unpack their tuna butties and smart price orange juice, speaking over each other in their second language, with their mouths full, they suck the life out of them straws, turning sideways. <laughs> If I never felt the brush of a trushy's wing, his pearly-eyed stare, his feathered splendor sings where a tree no longer stands. If I don't look again at the scars in this earth, at my stigmata skin, at the golden guava broken, its blood sugaring sweet the grass blades. We know the future forever happens. The book is open. This whole world is yours to imagine. All I know is it won't, if you don't, rise to see, to meet alive the firing sky. Host, the organism in or on which a parasite lives. You emerge on earth a human child, trees rattle ancestral branches, water otters round your trunk, light streams colour, amazement into wonder, you were made for each other. Elytra, first pair of wings, modified to form a hard shell. The crash of landing uproots who you are, the purpose of your mission. Colonising systems spawn in torn ground, infesting mother tongues. Boomy, ver, k, pokok, al rubbish la. The island runs out of school. You fly to England where water is frigid, learn to factor words into weapons. You're in deep cover so long, you forget you've never known why. Higher line. Transparent, like glass. Skin fair as peeled almond, hair black as blood. East eye slanted, west eye round. Which is the rightest? Your face is open as the moon, common poverty. A mirror into which strangers stare. Nymph, sexually immature form, usually similar to the adult. Your dad, 
They warned us about the local girls. Men who could be your dad. Where are you from? Where are you really from? You're just like a girl I met in a bar in the war in Singapore, Manila, Phuket. So young. Never guessed she was a pro. This exchange repeats until you accept it was you in that bar. We are still at war. Cryptic, colouring and or pattern adapted for the purpose of protection. Half-breed, you've been guilo, chink-eyed, mongrel, mixed-raced, in and out of so many circles, you're fine with BAME, though you get why anyone who actually belonged wouldn't be. Inquiline. A creature that shares the home of another species without having any obvious effect. You're a pro. Keep a bag half-packed at home from home in no one's land, miscellaneous minority other, navigating the foreign familiar, sheltering anonymous under greyish umbrellas. You could be anywhere, not even you know who you are, where you are going. Girdle, a strand of silk used to prop up the pupa. When your daughter ticks the white box, your hand rings at your heart, like Olivia de Havilland in Gone with the Wind. But why? I'm your mother. Don't leave me by myself again. You don't say that out loud. Holometabla. Complete transformation. Your genome migrates to another system, coded in a body in the body of a craft. Astronauts unlatch emerge onto pink moss, release pulsing loops of pheromones that call response from teeming ghosts which form, collapse, coalesce, unswallow this planet's sky in a breaking wave. Every atomized possible past and future you redeems a homing signal of exile and belonging. Abandonment is freedom. It looks beautiful, gawks the sales assistant. I slide my lips into a routine and well-performed smile. Thank you, I mirror back with fake enthusiasm. Holding the loose pleats of the knee-high dress, I gently twist from side to side. Mesmerised by its soft cotton sway, it's a delicate summer dress of bright floral print and I look cute as shit. I know it. She knows it. The whole fucking store can see I look amazing. I slide back into the store, lock the door behind me and hold my gaze in the reflection. The cut of the fabric slides down my chest, hugs my hips and gently cascades down my thighs. I am mesmerized by me. You could be this kind of girl, I think to myself. You could be a child of summer and sun and flowers and sweetness. You could ride bikes and have picnics and be delicate on a Sunday, badass on a Monday. You can be both. But in this small chamber, cocooned in this retail conglomerate, I am haunted by ghosts. Echoes of knobbly brown knees Restrained in crisp European dresses, young prisoners to British colonialism's Christianity, I cannot unsee the mission in me. These gushing pleats bleed the tears of the parents whose children were ripped from their arms, scratching and prying at the hands of priests. I cannot unsee the mission in me. As a child, I was quiet and gentle poised and wide-eyed to my surroundings. I think young me would have loved this dress. But these qualities are not conducive to surviving ongoing invasion. 
These are not the traits that erected this strong spine, that carved these sharp eyes, that grew this articulate mind. The colony made my softness meek. And in this moment, I wonder who I might have been. I look into the hardened face of someone I know and yet have never met. A survivor and a resistor. A child never allowed to bloom. And I think once I knew you. Standing amongst the faded faces of our stolen ch children, corners singed from disregard, I unzip. Their eyes watch me removed soft cotton and fold away the tenderness stolen from us. I return the fabric to the arms of the shop attendee and politely shrug. Not for you, she overempathizes. No, I mirror. Not quite. The hill is everywhere beyond my front door, and what I carry can never be put down. It's hard to remember a time when this weight was separate from my body. Aware it's being watched, the skin grows quickly over a burden, hardens like a myth, but keeps its sensitivity. There's a constant hum in my inner ear, and my nervous system is awash with fatigue. The enduring task is to leave the house, practice the art of oblivion, as if that could deflect your attention. At least it's exercise, or rehearsal. For what, I'm not sure. Am I lifting history, your thoughts of me? The hill could be the entire human world. The hill could be my shame. Steadfast and cumbersome. Each morning I wake spent, begin again. Scale and descend, scale and descend, the steep face of my appearance. Who else clambers up this fateful inclination, assumes this otherness? At the summit, breathless, alone, all I can do now is take it in. The vertiginous outlook I never asked for. I have left these impressions in the earth. I will be followed. I am. I am. I am. I am.